sermon at a, a local church in Kansas City, a pastor tells his congregants that he would like to bring up a close friend of his, a man he highly respects and sees more of a father figure than anything else to speak to them. The older gentleman begins to slowly make his way up to the pulpit, shaking the pastor's hand and then giving him a hug. Two young boys around the age of 12 are sitting in the front and looking quite bored and annoyed. The older gentleman begins telling a story to the church. 20 years ago, he took two young men out in the Pacific Seas on a 60-foot fishing motor sailor boat. One of the two young men was his 16-year-old son, who was a Christian, and the other man, young man was his son's lost best friend. About three hours into their voyage, they sailed right into a heavy storm. The boat ends up tipping over on its side, and both young men are thrown into the raging waters. The father is able to get to a life ring and looks out in the ocean waters to the far right is his son, doing his best to keep his head above waters, but is struggling. To the far left is his, is his son's best friend, also struggling to stay afloat. The father realizes that he has to choose to whom he will save, and that he doesn't have much time. In that very moment, the Lord presses on his heart that his son was a true believer. He was a Christian. That his friend was not. Tearfully, the father screams out to his son, I love you, Jason, and then throws the, the life ring to his friend. The father reels in the boy, then looks out to the seas for any sign of his son. Then he was gone. <clears throat> the older gentleman finishes his story and tearfully begins to head back to his seat. After church lets out, one of the young boys, who was sitting in the front, runs up to the old man and tells him, I can't believe he chose the other kid over his son. I don't believe it. The old man kneels down. Puts his hand on the young man's shoulder and says, If you won't believe me, ask your pastor. He's the one I threw the life ring to. <clears throat> Told you it gets me. <clears throat> the, the assurance of salvation that the father had about his son. It's a wonderful thing to have. Uh, you know, every one of us is not promised another day. Or another tomorrow. On the beat of our heart or another breath. Each, each and every one is a, is a gift and a grace of God. That he gives us on this earth. And he, give, and he gives it to us for a purpose and for a reason. And uh, it's not for us to sit on our hands. You know, I, I would think it'd be safe to say that the, the, the father didn't know his young man, his young son was a Christian just because he went to church. They wouldn't say that he, they knew his son was a Christian just because he read his Bible. Maybe just because he prayed, but because he had fruit. Fruit and uh, unto everlasting life is what the Bible calls it. And uh, we can't be so, uh, I don't know, deceived, I guess, to think, well, because we're General Baptist, we have that full assurance. No, that's not what it works, is it? We can't say because we attend church faithfully that we've got that full assurance. I don't see that listed as a fruit of a believer. It says if you should want to, right? But there, but there's so many things that, that we've taken and said, well, that's a standard and that's the standard of belief, and they're getting in or I'm getting in because I do whatever instead of resting on the complete and finished work of Christ. I am because He is. I am because what He did. I am because I believe, and because I believe, my life overflows with that belief. My, my life overflows with faith because of what I believe. And uh, sadly today, there's, there's a lot of people being deceived into believing that they, they think they are saved because they do a certain thing or a certain act. And uh, this week, and I'll, even last Sunday afternoon was in our conversation, and this week people have sent me videos and you know what do you think about this and what do I think about that and everything else and it's gone along right with what I've been studying you know I, 
I love studying end times. I love entomology is the big word there. I love studying about that stuff. And uh, one thing you see uh, when Jesus said, the way is narrow that leads to everlasting life, and few there be to find it. Few. Even though the, the opportunity, we believe, General Baptist, the opportunity is out for everybody. Everybody has the opportunity and the, the offer of salvation. But not everyone will. Because Jesus says, the way is narrow. Few there be that find it. So, so many are being deceived. And I would pray that uh, none of us be deceived. And how do we know that we're not deceived? We have to dig into God's word and study. And, and look to Christ and depend on the leading of his spirit. And not a false spirit. There's many that are deceived by a false spirit. It's not a Holy Spirit. It's not The Holy Spirit will lead you to holiness, righteousness. Helps you understand scripture. That's the, that's the, main, the first thing the Holy Spirit did to the disciples. He breathed on them, Luke 24. And he breathed on them and, and their understanding was open that they, that they understood scriptures. And that's a marvelous, marvelous thing. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Amen. You know, uh, last days, that's a phrase that's not in scripture very much. Eight times in reference to last days. And uh, several of those times, when they say it, they're mentioning it now. It says, well, now we are in the last days. Uh, I, I believe that last days started at the moment of Christ's ascension. You know, the countdown began. Ten, nine, eight. We've been, we've been watching all these uh, videos from NASA and the, the Mercury missions and Gemini and Apollo. Man, I love all that stuff. You know, I love the history. And, and to think that was, uh, what, uh, 60 years ago or so? How far technology has come in 60 years? And, uh, it, and it just just baffles me and amazes me. But uh, anyway... Back to chapter 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Are we in perilous times? We think so. We think so. Are, com in comparison to those that are, uh, you know, on average 215 or so people die for Jesus' sake as martyrs in the world every single day. Uh, we think we have perilous times, but what they have... That's some perilous times. The, the, those that uh, are in North Korea, uh, and if in North Korea they, they have the hot box, eight by eight by eight metal box. If you get caught being a Christian, having a Bible, talking about Christ, you get put in that and you get red water till you die. You know that's that's a horrible thing. And then and then your neighbors, they they have a thing where they where they to to try to catch all these Christians. If, if anyone in your neighborhood turns you in, the rest of the neighbors go to jail too because they didn't turn you in. Yeah. You should have known better. You know, so you go to jail too. So it's, it's a pretty good way of catching Christians over there. But, uh, and, then, and then we talk about the, the Muslim, in the Muslim world, how many people die at the hands of Muslims. Their favorite is beheading. Which goes wrong, right along with end time speaking. But but we think we've got it bad until we look at somebody else. And you look around the world, and uh, I know the, the Voice of the Martyrs has the the map, you know, of all the persecuted countries. Those where where it's illegal and you may get killed for for sharing the gospel. It's it's pretty pretty big. There's a lot of places, you know, a lot in the Middle East and Asia, and uh, and I think it's coming here. So this know that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men, and it goes through this list here, and you can find this same list in Romans 1. And we know uh, a, lot of, a lot of us like to take Romans 1, you, you use that for homosexuality. But it's got a whole list of sins that are in there. But it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heedy, high-minded, 
lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, some of y'all may have a Bible heading in there. I don't know if my, I like what mine says. Man wrote that, the headings, you know. And uh, But but I, I would attribute that, that that's an antichrist mindset. All those sins, that's, that's a... It's not the Antichrist. You know, it says in the Bible there are many Antichrists. But, but the, the mindset of the Antichrist is, is full of these wicked things. And in Romans 1 it says this leads to a reprobate mind. A mind that's, that's totally changed against God. Now I don't know if that reprobate mind can be changed back. The Bible's not clear on that. I'm not quite sure, but but they got a, they got a mind to sit on the things of the world, of pleasing the flesh, pleasing themselves, pleasing men, and not pleasing God. And, and if you look at this list, one of this doesn't apply to today. And I'll, some of y'all are are quite a bit older than I am, old enough to be my parents, and. Uh, It'd be an honor if you were. <laughs> but uh, but you've lived longer than I have. You've seen things that I've not seen. You've seen changes that I've not experienced. And the same thing for, you know, in the same way, me to my son or, or the little girl there. I've seen things that they're never going to see. I've experienced things that they're never going to experience. In the same way with, with us. You've seen changes that's happened in the world. How many of y'all have seen it grow more wicked? Yeah, and not just over a short period of time. How many of y'all was alive in the 50s? Experienced Elvis and rock and roll for the first time and, you know, and the moon landing and all that. You know, we, we watched videos from that time and said, you know, people dressed different in that time. It was modest. You know, they weren't all revealing everything. You, you could go to the store and not have to worry about seeing things hanging out that shouldn't be hanging out. But today's a little different. And I, I know in my time, I've seen it go downhill. Now, do, do I think that we are right near the end? It's possible. I won't say we're not, but I think we're, it's very possible. But when we look down this list, do we, are men lovers of their self? Are men generally covetous? Do they want things that are not their own? No, are they boasters? They like to brag on themselves. Are, are they proud? Blasphemers. I see a lot of blaspheming. Disobedient to parents. I don't think, I don't know, you, you may have a different opinion, but I don't think we've seen this one till here recently be as bad as what it is. You know, when you, you, know, you took away the whippings and the correction from kids, this, this little phrase, disobedient to parents, ran rampant. All you gotta do is run to the Walmarts and you see the disobedient to parents all over the place. <clears throat> Unthankful, unholy. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a little short little word there, but it, it has a, I mean, everything in this list applies to unholy. Everything in there, un, unholy. Without natural affection, without natural affection. What what did we just read in the in the news? A a, a woman just in popular blood was it just murdered their eleven year old child? Or was it? I, I was wrong on that. That was Marion, and it was a stepmom. A stepmom who murdered her eleven year old. Murdered her eleven year old. Yeah. It's Marion. They used to call that my hometown. That's a, that's ridiculous. We heard the, the news this morning. <coughs> right down the road from us, a 29-year-old was apparently walking down the highway at midnight and got hit by a car. What are you doing walking the roads at midnight? If your car broke, I mean, you got to have a good, pretty good reason for being out that late. And it's probably not good. You know, you'd hate to assume. 
but uh, 29 years old, her life is done. She don't get another chance. She don't get another opportunity. It's over for her. You know, on average, 168,000 people die every day. Majority of which I would be safe to say do not inherit eternal life. 168,000. So what a gift it is that we get to wake up again. But we go on down the list. Traitors, eating, hiding, and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. How, how many? How many can can honestly say you get more excited about the things of God than you do a football game? <laughs> Fishing. I haven't talked to the guys. I don't know about the women. You know, I, I don't. I don't know. My, my wife likes to craft, and she gets excited about taking pictures and things like that. But uh, do, do you have something that you get more excited about? Than the things of God, you know, when a, when the Scripture gets on you and it just, it just gets you overflowed. Amen. I don't want to be on that list. This is a bad list to be on. And if you find yourself on this list, there is a great and wonderful forgiving God that if you come to Him and you tell Him and ask Him to forgive you, He most certainly will. Amen. We don't want to be on that list. And then it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. They have a form of godliness. Without power. What does that look like? A form of godliness without power. <coughs> I think it kind of looks like a lot of the church today. Powerless. We were talking last Sunday about, you know, healings and seeing miracles and, and things like that, which I, I am one, or I are one, you know, whatever you want to say that, I am a walking, talking miracle. And I believe absolutely that God still does miracles today and he uses his people to do it. And and that's that's my mind. A lot of people don't have that mindset. They think that's done. That's the that's the dispensation that we're we're that's past. That's the apost apostles. They did all that. We don't have that anymore. I think that's a bunch of malarkey, a bunch of bull. And by saying that, that puts you into this category that deny the power thereof, denying the power of godliness, denying the power of holiness, denying the power that God can place on His people to heal, to preach, to teach. To love like nobody's been loved before. To reach people like nobody's been reached before. Not to sit on a pew and keep our hands warm. And then in verse 6, for this sort of days, the ghosts creep into houses and they lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is never able. It doesn't say sometimes able. It says never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And they, say they creep into the houses. Now, for me, when I read this, one thing comes to my mind. I, I worked for a time, and my mom was on Christian television. And I got to be around all those people on Christian television. And uh, frankly, I'll tell you, I don't like it. I don't like it. They're a bunch of greedy people. They're always asking for money, always begging money, having telephones, everything else, and, uh, and and I don't care for it. And I think, for myself, I think that's what this scripture falls into. We, we didn't, you know, with the telephones and all that stuff, we didn't have a lot of men calling in. It was the women that was calling in, and pledging, making their pledges. And I heard one guy said, and he was confessing it, how they had twisted and misused the name of God. He, he said, all we have to do is say, you know, God's speaking to me, and he tells me that there's, there's, a, there's a, a woman out there that you, you've got uh, money stashed in the cookie jar in the kitchen, and God wants you to give you that. And that's what they said. He, and he said, you know what? It worked. Because most of the people watching this is women. <coughs> and they have a stash of money in the cookie jar and they send it in 
So that, that's the mindset that that applies to there. But it says they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And from, from such, in verse 5, from such we should turn away. When we, when we see this going on in some people, when we see this going on in some people, we, turn, we should turn away from it. We, we don't overlook it. We don't overlook it. We say we, we're supposed to turn away from those things. And, and if you believe, it, if you believe we're in the last days, how many of y'all think that you're in your last days? You know, they, they used to call it you're getting on years, right? <laughs> Some of us are closer to their getting on years than the others. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not one that, 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 that likes to preach Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. Because how many of y'all grew up hearing that? And your grandparents hearing that? I think what we should be preaching is you're going to meet Jesus soon. You, yourself, is going to meet Jesus soon, and you're going to have to account for yourself. Not that, because my, my poor old grandma, she died thinking that she's going to be raptured out before she, before she died. She died. She didn't make it. I mean, bless her heart, she was so sure of that. That was one of the last things she told me. And she thought she was going to make it, and she did not. <clears throat> Over to verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12. It says uh, a little little phrase we should we should keep to memory. It says, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus may suffer persecution. Uh, uh, no? No, that ain't what it says. It says, and all that will get, live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Shall. If you turn up over to 2 Timothy 1 8, it says, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He said, If you do this right, if you live godly in Christ Jesus, if you preach the gospel the way the Bible says preach the gospel, it says you will be popular, but not for a good reason. Jesus said, they know marvel that they hate you because they hated me first. Galatians yeah. 1.10 says, Paul says, for I now, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Our Christian walk is not to please our neighbors, our family, our friends, those in our church. Our Christian walk, first and foremost, is to please God, to seek his face, to seek to please him. To, man, there ain't nothing like knowing that you put a smile on God's face when he puts that joy in you. And there, there is joy that comes with obedience. Joy during persecutions. Joy during trials. Joy, joy during... Everything the world can throw at you. Over in chapter 4, verse 1. Because I charge thee therefore before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now, I, 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 want, I don't think he's talking just to Timothy here. I believe this is for me. I believe... From the end of the beginning to the amen at the end of Revelation, this is all for me. I believe this is all for you. 100%, completely, all of it is for you in some way, shape, or form. And you can't get out of it. This is the standard of truth. Everything else is lower than this. Even our beloved Constitution is lower than this. I know that. There's a lot of people there. Go ahead and go by. You got to go by the Constitution. Go by the Constitution. No, let's go by the Bible. Bible first and foremost. But it's the Bible. And verse two, he says, "Preach the word." Now I want, I want you to take your finger, point it right at your nose, <laughs> and look at it. 
right there and say, preach the word. <laughs> preach the word. Preach the word. You know it's not the pastor's job to build the church or the preacher's job. You know, evangelists, you know, that's, that's their main calling is going out and reaching the lost, right? But it, it, the, and the pastor's job is to lead the sheep, make to green pastures, to teach, you know, to make sure, make sure they're getting the right food, right? But shepherds don't make sheep. Sheep make sheep. You know, it's, it's basic biology, right? Shepherds make more shepherds, right? The sheep make sheep. Whose, whose responsibility is it to build the church? Take that finger again. <laughs> Put that right there. Right there. And if, I had, if I had everybody have a mirror, you know, I could put it up there and tell you. Verse 2 again, it says, Preach the word, be instant, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of that thy ministry. I think the time is coming and now is where they will not endure sound doctrine. The time is coming and now is where they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, people send me, said, go listen to this sermon. So I can't listen to that sermon. It's garbage. It's garbage. It's, it's, they learned real good from their father the devil how to twist scripture to make it sound good, to make it, their ears tickled a little bit, to make them feel good about themselves. We, we are not in the business to feel good, about, make you feel good about yourself. We should exhort one another, help draw one another, make sure we stay connected to Jesus. But it's not, it's not my job to say, you just need to feel good about yourself. If you got sin in your life, you need to repent. You need to turn from your sin. While you, God still graces you with a breath in your body to do so. Turn over to, to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Three. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Don't catch on real good. <laughs> Hebrews 3. I like verse 6. Christ has a son over his own house. Whose house are we? Amen. If. Say if. 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 That's a conditional word. I know I've said it before. And I have just about every if. Circled in my Bible because it's conditional. It means there's something that happens. And I've used the used the reference of my son. If you mow the lawn, you get an allowance. If you do clean your room, you get this. If I'm a really good boy, I'll get ice cream. <laughs> it's been a while since I've had ice cream. <laughs> what? Uh -uh. I don't know what that's saying. But anyway, so if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. If we hold fast the confidence. What's our confidence in? Is it me that I'm a good person? Is my confidence in that I, I sit in church on Sunday? I have a Bible that's marked all up and I got notes. I took notes. I'm a good person. I deserve heaven. Now, if your confidence rests in yourself, then you're failing. Your confidence should be on Jesus Christ. And, the, and he says, the, and the rejoicing. How many churches you go into, it's more like a funeral than it is a church service. There should be some rejoicing. We should be happy to get in the house of God with the people of God. And, and hear testimonies of one another. You know, that's, that's what we see the early church did. They, they went, you know, that's part of that exhorting. It says, you know, listen to how, what God did through me this week or yesterday or today. Because, you know, they, they met house to house, breaking bread with one another daily. And in the temple daily, 
They, they, they were like a close-knit family. But in that rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. Leonard Dravenhill, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. He, he's an author. He's an evangelist. Probably one of my favorite guys to listen to or read. He wrote a book called Why Revival Terries. That I love. And, uh, and it's a good one if you've not read it. But he said, true Christianity has not been weighed in the balance and found wanting. It's been tried, found too difficult, and rejected. When you, when you see those scriptures that say, well, that's just a little hard for me. And Peter said, us and the apostles, we've given, we've given all we have to follow you. What about us? And it's in Mark 10. And that follows the rich young ruler who did not give up everything. He had the opportunity to be the 13th apostle. And he wouldn't give up everything. And Peter said, what about us? We gave up everything. That's hard things to hear. But verse 7 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the days of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, that if any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Boy, that's a glorious scripture. That's a glorious, and you see how he goes from verse 6 and wraps it back around in verse 14. If we hold fast that confidence, not in ourselves, but of Christ Jesus, if we don't harden our hearts. I know what it's like to be hard-hearted. I know what it's like to be outside of God's will. I know what it's like to, they say it's a slow fade. When you slip away, to feel yourself drifting, or that, that hunger for the word isn't there anymore, that that desire to pray isn't there anymore. I know what that's like. I don't ever want to go back there. Mm -hmm. And safe to say, there's probably somebody in here that's there. But what's it, what's it say? It said, exhort one another daily while it's called today. So don't waste time waiting for tomorrow. Exhort one another daily. Today's the day of salvation. If you notice a brother or a sister slipping off, maybe some things come out of their mouth that ain't right. What do you do? Exhort me. Draw them near. Draw them near while it's today. Draw near. You may not get another chance. How many of y'all ever lost a loved one, someone near to you, that you didn't say what you should have said and they slipped off? We probably, if we're honest, raise our hands and say it's true. How many of y'all have loved ones right now that you need to reach because they're slipped off? Having a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Oh, it's not an easy thing to hear. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This is the doctrine of the church. Hebrews is full of great doctrine. And, and it goes along with, with last days. You know, verse 4, chapter 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. And any of you should seem to come short of it. Don't come short. There is, a, there is a thing of the fear of God that compels you. It's the beginning of wisdom. It says it twice in Proverbs. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. 
That's what compels you to flee from sin and to run to God. And then it's the love of God that compels you to repent. It's the love of God. Because why do you do the things you do? Because I love him. Amen. Because he first loved me. Amen. I love him so much. We gotta feed the poor. Uh, we we do a thing at, at up in Rosely. We call the table. You know, the people everybody's like, oh, welcome up at our table. And we feed what was it four hundred and some odd families a couple boxes of food. You know, it should both be enough to last them like a week or so. I don't know, but uh, that, that's an amazing thing. I don't do that because I think I have to, because there's a, a it's written in there. Which, which it is, you know, Matthew 25 which talks about feeding those that feed the hungry. You know, it, it's in there, but I don't do it because it's written in there. I do it because I love God. And because I love God, I have to love people. There's a, there's a lost and dying world that's, that's going to hell. It's, you know, they say going to hell in a handbasket, however you want to put it. They're, they're going to hell. And, it, and if we can feed people some food, and through that, be able to deliver the gospel and see lives change, see people's hearts change, see them go from a hater of God to a lover of God, by all means, I'll spend everything I have to get money to, to feed the poor. If, if, if it takes, if I have to skip a Sunday afternoon nap to go door knocking, we'll do it. I love Sunday afternoon nap. I was growing up, and it's, it was built into my DNA. You had a Sunday afternoon now. But, but there's so many things that, well, you know, I just don't feel like it. Well, the Bible says you're supposed to reach the lost. Not your pastor, not a preacher, not an evangelist, but you are supposed to reach the lost. And, and that's not just inviting them to church and let somebody else do the work for you. It's study to find out what the gospel is. According to scripture, 1 Corinthians 15 lays it out pretty solid. This is the gospel, he says, and, and he lists off the things that are included in the gospel. Learn what that is and go tell people how they might be saved. What it means to be born again. Share with them your testimony. We shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. How did God change your life and make you a new creature? If you don't know it, Maybe you're not saved, but if you are, figure it out, write it down. Maybe rehearse it so you know how to go and share with others the wonderful works of God. Amen? I love you enough to tell you the truth. Love your neighbor enough to tell you the truth. Tell them the truth. Love your loved ones enough to tell them the truth. So if you believe hell is hot, and you don't want people to go there. Right. If you believe God is real and his love is everlasting, do you believe it enough to do something about it? I'm preaching to myself, too. <laughs> and let, me, let me close with this, with this thought, with this idea. Uh, it, it, is, it is not the will of God for you to get caught in this loop of religion. Go to church, go home. Go to church, go home. Go to church Wednesday night, Sunday night, Sunday morning. You know, you, you get caught in this loop and, and you never really do anything for God and for his kingdom outside of that. It's really easy to get caught in that. And, uh, you know, some say, well, you know, I, I did my part. I've worked for God all my life. And, uh, you know, I've put my time in. No, you still have breath in your body. And you still have a purpose. Or else you would have no breath in your body. And God has a purpose for each and every one of us. And a plan for each and every one of us. And he wants us to reach the lost. I would love to see this building full to overflowing. You know, we talk we talk about the old the old time revivals not very long ago where where people were outside the church trying to listen through the windows because there was no room inside because there was people on fire for God 
And people saw the smoke and they wanted to see what's burning. Won't you burn for God? Won't you burn for him?